This evening, we're going to read James chapter 1, verses 2 through 12. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work. Ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. And it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is, he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he, pass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. You may be seated, and Associate Pastor Mello will come and preach. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you for your prayers. It's really have been helpful, and I've seen a difference in my body, and I'm glad to be here to preach be given this opportunity to preach by God's grace. And so um, every opportunity I get from God to preach, I'll do my best to preach with everything I have. One day I won't be here. <clears throat> I will be in heaven. I don't want to leave this world not giving out my best, my very best at everything I do. So. <clears throat> With that said, let's begin. The title of my message for this evening is Persevering Through Trials. Persevering Through Trials. It is trials and tribulations in the life of a Christian that refines our trust in God and increases our dependence upon the Lord. It is it is trials and tribulations, as Jesse read in our text, which is James 1, 12, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. It is trials and tribulations that refine us, that refine our trust and increases our dependence. The new year has already begun that way with trials and tribulations for all of us. Please try again. Now, often, it is our reaction to the difficulties and dangers we face in our everyday lives, and even to the distresses and despair of others that determine whether we truly have faith in what we believe about Christ's sufficient strength. Right? Some of you say you have faith, but it is trials and tribulations that truly Determine whether you truly have faith in the one that promises, that claims to have all strength, Jesus Christ. You see, we can all run around telling everybody of how strong is our God. But when you are tested and tried, and it seems like your body, your mind, your heart, has failed to continue to keep on. That's the moment in weakness when you truly, your faith truly is tested and truly you show and your reaction whether you truly have faith in the one that has all strength and all fullness and can deliver you from the issues of life. Yes, a man's true character and faith is revealed when he is being tested, not when he is not, not when God seems to be blessing that man, 
And there is no need for him to cry out for mercy or for help. Our text says, blessed is the man that endured temptation. Blessed. 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 That's a beatitude. Blessed. Blessed. Now, for some reason or another, we tend to think that if a man or a woman who is a Christian is struggling in his or her faith, it is perhaps because he or she lacks faith or has lost favor with God. Again, we tend to think this way, but that is not necessarily true for the Bible says that we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his, pep to his purpose. So from this verse, we see that God could not have any ill intentions to hurt us in letting trials oppress us. He couldn't because all things for the Christian, all things work together for good. Therefore, we should be as Christians cautious on how we judge the mishaps and the trials and tribulations that a child of God goes through in their everyday life. Remember Job. Remember his friends. We should be cautious on how we judge another brother, another sister's trials and tribulations. For again, our text says, blessed is the man that endured temptations. Now, I want you to notice something in our text, which I think is very important, and that Spurgeon noted in his sermon on this same text. And that is that it doesn't say blessed is the man that is tempted. It doesn't say that. Nor does it say blessed is the man that is overcome by the temptation. I heard that many Christians say that. I was, oh, well, I was close, but I was overcome by temptation. Nor does it say, blessed is the man who is never tried, never afflicted, never tempted. No, but it says, blessed is the man that endures temptation. In other words, that bears temptation, that survives it. The beatitude, it's blessed. Bless. The Christian is called to survive temptation. Not to give in. Not to fall in it. Very, very different approach. And how different do we see in the scriptures how a man is blessed in comparison to what you see in the world. In contrast to what you see in other Christians that claim to be Christians. Who oftentimes, by ignorance, not knowing the scriptures, think that they're blessed because they went through temptation. No. No. Blessed is the man that endured, that survives temptation, that does not fall in temptation. Yes. But now. Think about this. In the second part of our text, we read of a reward. In our text, the Apostle James speaks of a reward that Christ will give to those who obey and endure temptation. This is now what I believe a true incentive to those that survive temptation. The Apostle James did not just end there. But he gave us more of an incentive to those who truly survive temptation. It says, blessed is the man that endured temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord had promised to them that love him. When he is tried, when he's approved. He shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord had promised to 
them that love them. And so tonight, the purpose of my sermon is to encourage you, brothers and sisters, to welcome tribulation and to endure it with joy. For great will be your reward in heaven. And yes, it will indeed be great. Listen to this sermon. Do not go to sleep. I see eyes being closed. Do not go to sleep. This is not the time. There is a reward for those that endure temptation. Even closing your eyes. First, every true Christian should welcome and endure temptation with joy and patience. With joy and patience. Yes, brothers and sisters, we should. For our text says, blessed is the man that endured temptation. And the context of our text confirms that. At the in the beginning of chapter 1, James, James says, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall or ye, when ye encounter diverse or various temptations. Count it all joy. Now why? Why does he say to welcome them? To count it all joy? Well, the answer is found in the next verse. He tells us why. He says, knowing this. That the trying or the testing of your faith, work it, patience. Work it, patience. So, so James is saying that it is tribulations and temptations in our life that work it, patience. Which is one of the greatest characteristics and virtues that a true Christian can possess after conversion. According to 2 Peter 1.3.6. Now listen to this. Listen to what Peter said to the Christians of the first century church. He says, quote, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power had given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him, who that had called us to glory and virtue. He called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. So we're given the divine nature the moment we trust Christ, and which we need to develop, which are faith and virtue into virtual knowledge, into knowledge temperance or self-control. And trust me, Christians, there's many here, including myself, that need self-control. That is a virtual, that is a characteristic, that is something that you should work on. Into knowledge temperance, self-control, and to self-control patience. And to patience, godliness or holiness. Patience, that's a characteristic. That is a dress code that you as a Christian should have. And none of us, none of us here have patience fully. None of us. And I like the illustration Spurgeon gave about having true patience. He said something that was very good that just strike me. He said, if you are a woman, a Christian, and you claim to be patient, very patient, ask yourself a question. Have you lost, if you're married, have you lost your husband? Have you lost a child? Has you, have you lost kids? Have you lost your husband? Have you lost a loved one? And then ask yourself if you're truly patient. Spurgeon said that to his congregation. And I was struck by that. I said, when we think we have reached some degree, some level of patience, we see how much we lack. Because when we are tested, we lose control. We lose our patience. But yet, that is one of the greatest characteristics that a Christian should strive for and should possess. If you're truly Christian, 
People are watching the Super Bowl and watching football. They think Tom Brady throws a big touchdown or they see soccer or they see the World Cup and they see that's a great mastery to achieve. Try this one, patience. Try patience. Yet Jesus was perfect at this. Perfect. Perfect. Never lost control. Perfect. You think it's hard to win the Super Bowl? Try patience. Be perfect at it. I'm challenging you, man. Some of you that close your eyes, challenge you, man. Be patient. Be patient. You think that's easy? I want to I want to see it. Be patient. All the days of your life, like Jesus was. Perfect. Perfect. Yes, these are the virtues that make up, or in other words, that dress up the Christian. When people see us, this, is, this should be our dress code. They should see humility and patience like our Lord had. This is what Peter was talking about in our text. And he's teaching us that one virtue leads to another and so on. And so this is why Jem said in chapter 1, verse 2, to count it all joy when you encounter, when you encounter various temptations, because temptations will work in us patience. And as I said earlier, patience is one of the greatest virtues that a Christian should have. We should strive for it. So when let them when temptations are coming in, we should come at all joy. We shouldn't run away from it. We should know that it is our Lord who is working in us. Patience. And when we dress with patience, you will see the effect that you're going to have in this world. At your job. At your school. With your parents. You will see the effect that you're going to have when you have perfect patience. It's not a small thing. Oh, I heard that before. No, patience. Try it. But there's more. We need to endure temptation. Not just welcome temptation. Well, it's here. I'm going to welcome it. No, endure. We need to endure it. We need to bear it and survive it. Yes, James said, blessed is the man that endure, that survives temptation. Not when you fall. Now, well, I, I did it again. I shoot my mouth out. I blasted this person. I blow this one away. No. Blessed is the man that endure temptation. Endure. Now, how can a Christian endure, bear temptation? How does the word of God tell us? Well, the prince of preachers, Charles Spurgeon, said something that I believe was very important and that helped me to answer this question to my biblical satisfaction. He said, quote, those who endure temptation rightly, correctly, endure it because they love God. Because they love God. Yes, C.H. Spurgeon was right. There is no driving force that can be stronger and more effective than our love for our God that will aid us in bearing temptation. Because our love for our Lord flows out of his love for us. He is the first cause of our love. And we know that the Bible supports that. Read Romans chapter 5, verse 8. It says, but God commended, praised his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yes, think about this verse. But God praised his love. Whose love? Christ's love. God praised Christ's love toward us. Christ loved us so much. That he died for us. But he died for us before we were yet sinners. God, think about God, the father, looking at his son's love toward us. That he will go to that extent to die for us. 
to die for our souls while we were yet sinners. We were unrepented sinners, and yet Christ went on the cross and died for us. So God is commending, is praising his son's love. He said, how could my son do this? How could my son love sinners so much? Does that excite you? Does it get you going? God is commending, is praising his son. Some of you are saved, are Christians, but you are not as amazed of what Christ has done in your life more than God. God didn't sin. God, his father, didn't sin. And yet he's seeing his son go through this suffering for us. And some of you sit here not even amazed. Okay, he died for me. No, God is praising. God, the father, is looking at his son and praising him. That he will die for us even before we ever repented. You see? That's the love that C.E. Spurgeon is talking about. This is what he's talking about. This is what fuels us. This is what energizes us to do what? Endure temptation. When you see what Christ has done and you truly, if you truly love him for that, this will be the fuel that will energize you and help you overcome temptation. Overcome temptation. I'm going to shoot my mouth. I'm angry. That will stop you right there. If you put a thought of what Christ has done. If you love Christ and you look at him. No, I won't. No, and I don't. Because Jesus. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me so much. I love him for what he has done. I'm not going to do it. I'm restrained. I'm going to walk away. I'm going to do whatever it takes. That's what I'm talking about. That's what Prince of Preachers is talking about. Yes, brothers and sisters, it starts with Christ and what he has done for us and for our lives. This is the driving force if you're a true Christian that will aid you to overcome temptation. Now, Spurgeon said this. That, quote, when you endure temptation out of love to God, then you are blessed. Then you are blessed. If you endure temptation out of love to God, he added, I cannot see how a man can be unhappy who really loves God. Love to God is in itself such a delightful emotion that before long, the indulgence of it perfumes the whole mind with happiness. To love you, my God, said Spurgeon. To love you, my God. Surely if you give me no more than this, I will bless you forever and ever. It is heaven enough for such a poor creature as I am to be permitted to love the Lord, my God, with all my heart, soul, and strength. Think about it. It is heaven enough for such a poor creature like mine. Think about Spurgeon, what he's saying here. That God will let us love him. Us who sin against him day and night. Day and night we sin. We neglect his word. He bores us. We'll rather be on YouTube, watching movies, relaxing. But when we read God's word, oh, it's a chore. Think about it. It's a chore to you. But look what Prince of Preacher is saying here. It is heaven. It is heaven enough for such a poor creature as I am. That's what we are, poor creatures. To be permitted to love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, and strength. Think about this. Yes, brothers and sisters, our love for Christ is our aid and our strength to overcome trials and temptations. It is. See, Spurgeon is right on this. Overcoming trials and temptations for the Christian, it is not legalism. 
that's what he's saying. He's saying it's not moral keeping. No, it is not obeying more commands, more rules. Oh, how do I keep myself from temptation, from falling? I keep falling. I watch pornography, but I keep falling. I keep falling. How, how? It's not moral keeping. No, it is not legalism. But it is by having an intimate relationship with our Lord and our God. Yes, this is how we overcome the flesh. This is how we overcome the world. And this is how we overcome the devil. When you love God. Because when you love God, it's hard. It's hard when you're spending time with God to turn your computer on and watch porn. When Jesus is present, it's very difficult that you turn your computer on and watch porn. It is. How? Jesus is present. If you're a true Christian, you're broken. You're humble. You're patient. God just, he's there. You're not going to do anything like that. Not in his presence. You see? But what drives you to his presence? Your love to God. If you don't love God, you're not going to seek and search for his presence. You're going to turn the computer on. You're going to go on YouTube. You're going to watch the Super Bowl. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. Because you don't love God enough to drive you to his presence. That's what Spurgeon is getting at. That's what this text is all about. Now, let me ask you a question, Christian. Have you experienced the love of Christ? Have you experienced his loving grace upon your soul? And have you experienced the forgiveness of your past, present, and future sins? Have you? God saw his son and commended his love toward us. He did. Whoa, my son dying for unrepented sinners. Now, what do you do? You're the benefit. You benefited from his sacrifice, from his outpouring of his soul for dying for you. What about you? Have you experienced the love of Christ? Have you experienced his loving grace upon your soul? And have you experienced the forgiveness of your past, present, future sins? It's serious. Ask yourself those questions because this, the answer to these questions will be the fuel, will be the driving force that helps you to go to see at, at, at your Lord and love them and drive you to him every time. And your union with him, your time with him will become, become so precious just like when you spend so much time with your wife or your girlfriend or somebody you love, you spend so much time with that person that you don't want to separate. When you separate for a few hours, it feels like eternity. You want to be back with that person. Very difficult to not be loyal to somebody that you love. Very easy to not be loyal to somebody that you don't love. That's why you see in the world is divorce. Because men are not loyal. And women are not loyal as well to their husbands. It's vice versa. So it's very easy to cheat on your spouse. Why? Because you don't love her enough or don't love him enough. Now we're all sinners. But yet, the more time you spend with that person, the more time you will be endeared to that person. You see, that's what I'm getting at. So the more time you spend with your spouse, the more time you are endeared to her. Yes, you see imperfections in her, but also you see things that you that makes you love her more. You see, you see both. And all these good things are good things that make you fall in love for her. The same thing with Jesus. The more time you spend with Christ, the more time you will be thinking about him and you will be seeing the goodness of who he is. And you will fall in love with him. And it's going to be very difficult, even under temptation, to break away. Because you'll remember all that time that you spent with Christ. 
everything he's done for you and he's doing in your life, you will, you will be afraid to offend him in any way, okay? Do you love the Lord? Do you love Christ enough that you will renounce to sin when temptation comes? Blessed is the man that endured temptation. Blessed, blessed. It's a good thing. Blessed, you are blessed. Second and last, every true Christian who endures temptation will be rewarded a crown of life when the Lord comes. Yes, our text says, blessed is the man that endured temptation for when he is tried, approved, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord had promised to them that love him. Notice it says that love him. That love him. He promised to them that love him. Right? Let's not forget, love him. Yes, Jesus promises a crown of life to every Christian who loves him and endures temptation. Now Spurgeon is right on this. He said that the reward is given not to them that endure temptation only, but to them that endure because they love him. For this are they that cannot fall into sin because it will grieve him who loves them so well and whom they love with all their hearts. But you may abstain or withdraw from sin from my motive, which will lend no virtue to your self-restraint. Yes, some restrain from sin from fear of men or from hope of gain. As a thief is honest when he sees a policeman. But to restrain you from sin because you love God, yes, said Spurgeon, that is the thing. That's what this verse is talking about. Because you love him. Now, I agree with Spurgeon. We have people all over the world who are not Christians and yet live very clean and moral lives. And yet, it doesn't make them into Christians and they won't be rewarded in heaven either. And so it will be with you, Christian. I'm talking safe Christians. And so it will be with you, Christian, if you don't love your God and overcome temptation. But now, our Lord has prepared something special, special for those who do love him and overcome temptations. Yes, this is an incentive and a good reason why we should spend time to draw near to our God and to learn to love him so that we don't easily surrender to sin. Our text says, blessed is the man that endured temptation for when he is approved, he shall receive the crown of life. Now, James is saying, furthermore, that when a Christian endures temptation, he will be approved when he endures, when he survives. He will be approved by God, by Jesus Christ. So he is approved. And by being approved, Jesus shall give him, give that a specific person a crown of life. So you are approved first by Christ. So when you endure, you're approved. When you're approved, Christ will reward you with the crown of life. Dr. James Vernon McGee said, and I agree with him, that the crown of life, okay, now think about this. The crown of life is not salvation, but it represents a reward. And in the scripture, it is something that is given to an individual as a reward. Now, there are many crowns mentioned in scripture, which are given as rewards to believers just as we find that there are different kinds of punishment for the laws. Probably this is new information for some of you, but that's true. Jesus said in one of his parables in Luke 12, 48, that some will receive many stripes and others will receive fewer stripes than others. Likewise, there are degrees of rewards for believers. 
And I know that Paul, like James, was very much interested in this crown of life here in James. For both talked about it in the epistles, and they knew that the way to receive it was to undergo, undergo and endure temptations. And we know the life of the apostle Paul. We know the life of James. And we know that they went through many temptations and trials. They were victorious and survived and overcame many of them because they were searching for this crown of life. They were fighting. They were living the Christian life. And they were thinking about their rewards. When you become a Christian, you don't stop there. Oh, I have eternal life now. What's next? Let's buy a house. Let's buy this. Let's buy that. All those things are fine. But your mind goes from thinking heavenly to thinking earthly. Have you noticed many Christians, when they become Christians, they go from heavenly minded to earthly minded. What happened? What happened? There's enough in the word of God to keep your mind in heaven. What happened? I hear many Christians after they profess to know Christ and looks like there's a change in their lives, they become more worldly than before they were Christians. Because at least they were seeking something spiritual. They were searching and seeking after Christ. But they got Christ, now they go back to the world. What happened? That's not the Christianity of the apostles. Because after they trusted Christ, they were searching and seeking and striving after masteries, heavenly masteries, heavenly masteries, crowns. Well, that's not important. Oh, that's too heavenly minded. No, I just, you know, I'm just going to pull back in the crowns. Okay, so now you think about your house. So that's more spiritual, right? Let's not think about the crowns. That's too much to ask. Let's think about house or a car or my career. No, think about crowns. Think about spiritual things because they're there. The Bible gives you enough to work on, enough to keep your mind busy about heavenly masteries, heavenly things, spiritual things. Now you have to get, we have to get in and get into this crown of life because there's something special here. James and Apostle Paul fought and died and underwent a lot of persecution because their end goal was Christ. Their end goal didn't end at the moment they trusted Christ. Their end goal was to search after Christ. Because there, there's more of Christ there in heaven. When you go to heaven, it's not going to be palaces and gold and silver and this and that. Those are things that will probably be there. Yeah, they'll, they'll be there. But that's not the end goal. There's more of Christ. There's more of Christ. There's more to go after. There's more to seek. There's more to search. If you love the Lord, you want more of the Lord. You want more of him. Now, this is what J. Vernon McGee and Charles Spurgeon believe about what it, this crown of life is all about. What is this crown of life? What is this crown of life? I believe what they believe about this. This is what J. Burning McGee said. He said that this crown of life will represent in heaven what brings us closest to our Lord. What brings us closest to our Lord. Yes, just like the seraphims who are right now flying around the throne of God and crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. In Isaiah 6, yes, these majestic creatures live closest to the throne than any other creature recorded in scripture. And so I believe like Dr. McGee and Spurgeon, who said that this crown of life will probably bring us closer to our Lord than anything else, than anything else. This crown of life will draw us closer to him. Now, this is not an absolute truth, but to my biblical understanding, the most probable one. For Christ is the source of all life. 
And if this crown represents more life than having eternal life, then the only thing higher, greater than that, must be to be near to the source of all life, who is Jesus Christ himself. And that's to me most probable than anything else. What could be greater? You already have eternal life. What could bring us closer? What could be more life? What could give us more life other than Christ, who is the source of all life? And so just like the seraphims who live in that glory, who cry out, holy, 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 they live close. They are the beings that live the closest to the throne of God. And so I believe, like Spurgeon, like McGee, that maybe this crown will draw us near to our Lord. Our communion, our love towards him will be shown that way. We will be rewarded by being close to the one we love. Close to the one we love. But you must love him, right? You got to love him or else you're not going to want to be close to him. But if you truly love him, this crown of life, I believe, will be the aid, the agent to draw us near to our Lord. And I want to be near to him. I don't know about you. Maybe you want to be balanced. I heard Christians say, I want to be balanced. I don't want to, I'm a Christian now. I trusted in Christ. My sins are forgiven, but I'm going to be balanced now. I don't want to be too religious. I don't want to show to the world. Maybe I'll be more attractive to people, bringing people into the church if I am balanced. Because I noticed that Christians who are too radical, they don't tend to be the best soul winners. I heard Christians say this. They don't tend to be the best soul winners. They're the ones that are more one foot in the world and one foot in the church. And I kind of have more of an attraction to the world. So people from the world kind of come into the church because they see that I'm not really radical and crazy and like all those other Christians who are crazy. Notice that. But that's not Spurgeon. Some of these people who are like that read Spurgeon, but they don't, they're not like Spurgeon. They just read Spurgeon. They fill their minds with theology, but their heart have no idea what Spurgeon, McGee, and many of these people believe. No, 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 no. We got to be radical. The way you bring, the way you are a spiritual Christian attraction to the world, you, you show them that there is a Christ and that there is a real Christ. You show them where you like, who you, who you love. By doing that, the people that God is working on, those people will recognize you, will see your drive, will see your love for the Lord, and the Spirit of God will take care of the rest. I'm not going to be balanced here now. I'm going to be too crazy if I go super spiritual now. No, 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 no. When you come to Christ, you push, you strive to be near to him. Doesn't matter what anybody says. It doesn't matter what the world thinks. This balance thing from new evangelicalism is false. It's wrong, completely wrong. Not biblical at all. Not biblical at all. Not biblical. And I'm not saying there's people, I'm, I'm talking, we have to be careful what we hear and what we see out there. We should be fellowshipping with other brothers and Christians in the church. Absolutely, we should but we should also still be a witness to them. Show them the right way. Show them the right path. Show them that we are radical for Christ because this crown of life, I want this crown of life. I really do. I used to run for cross country and track. I used to run for crowns that perish, but this, this is eternal. This is eternal life. This is what we should be striving for. We should this should blow our minds. I don't care what people think about me. I don't. I don't care about richness and all. I want this crown. I want to be near to my God. I want to be near to my God when I get to heaven. I want to be the closest I can. I want this crown because I want to be close to my God. Forget this world. 
They don't love me anyways. But my Lord loves me. My Lord loves me. He wants me to be near. He wants you to be near to him. He wants you to be very close to him. I want this crown of life. Now, see Spurgeon described having the crown of life this way. Now, listen to this and ask yourself, if we don't have a wonderful future ahead of us for those who overcome temptations. Quote Spurgeon, if we live through faith in Christ, by God's grace, a life that shall be full of purity and holiness, God will give us a crown, not of laurel, nor of parsley, nor even of gold and rarest gems, but a crown of life that he has promised to them that love him. What is a crown of life? What is life, he says? Well, life is not mere existing. In fact, existence, though it is essential to life, does not enter into the meaning of life nor so much as come near it. For to live means to be in health, to be in vigor, to be in force, to be in joy, to be in right and fit condition, to have one's whole self in order and to enjoy all that surrounds you with all that is within you. Yes, we shall all be forever Filled with the fullness of God. There shall be no pain. Think about it. No pain. No misery. But a plenitude of enjoyment at his right hand. Where there are pleasures forevermore. All your life shall be crowned. And all the crown shall be life. Amen. Yes, brothers and sisters. Charles Spurgeon's description of what life will be like in heaven for us who overcome trials and temptations here on earth sounds surreal to our limited mind and understanding. But if I tell you that even these words have failed to describe truly what our experience will be like in heaven, you will probably think that I have completely lost my mind and that I am living in a dream. But the truth is that for the true Christian that overcomes temptation, it will not be a dream. This will happen. This and more will be in our future. Yes, what Spurgeon said, it doesn't even get close. For the Bible says, that I had not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man, Spurgeon or us or any of you, the things which God had prepared for them that love him, that love him. So it is not an exaggeration at all. I had not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man, the things which God had prepared for them that love him. Yes, brothers and sisters, that love him. Now I'm concluding the sermon. I conclude here. And I hope that this simple sermon will help and encourage all of you to draw near close to your God, to your Christ. This is for everyone. That is a Christian, everyone who is saved, who is a true Christian. This is a promise for everyone. God wants to be close to all of us. We don't know how many seraphims are in heaven, but I know there's a lot. And there's enough space for everybody to fit there. So don't think that, well, there's too many going in that direction. No, 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 no. There's plenty of space, infinite space for all of you to reach the highest of the highest the spiritual highest of the highest. Is that where you want to go, Christian? You want to be up, up in heaven, but you want more? You want more of Christ or you want less? You just want to be balanced. You want to be balanced so that I'm accepted in the world, 
and then I'm accepted in the church. Or you want to reach the highest, the Himalayas. What you want to do? You want to reach heaven? Be up with the Lord? Satisfy being with him? That love him. That love him. I conclude here. And now our dear pastor, Chan, will come and close the service. And anything else that, that he needs to say, I'm sure there might be things. But I hope I made myself clear. This sermon, God really spoke to me through these two weeks of trial. I felt at some point that I was going to die. I said, I got to give something before I die. I'll write a sermon. Maybe I'll give my last sermon. I was thinking all kinds of things. My mind was everywhere in circles. But I'm here. I prepared the sermon. I hope that inspires you to push, push for heavenly things, heavenly crowns. And when I see you in heaven, I'll be, wow. You live for the Lord. You truly live for the Lord. This person really live for the Lord. You see, that's, that will make a pastor, I think that will make any pastor or any Christian happy to see all of you just up there reigning with the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Miller. Now, I want you to think about <clears throat> what Sergio just said. And I want you to think about, did that resonate with you, what he just said, you know? Because if you're a Christian, it, it'll resonate with you. You're, you'll either get convicted of sin, of, your, of where you are with Christ, or you're excited. But if it doesn't do any of that, then something is wrong, see? Let me just speak a little bit to Christians, and then I'm going to speak to the lost a little bit. Let me just mention this whole thing about balance. There is someone in the Bible that wanted to be balanced, that wanted to be overboard. His name is Saul. And God told him, destroy the Malachites. Don't let anyone live. But he thought, whoa, that's extreme. Wait a minute, that's not what he meant. That's what God meant. He just meant, you know, just weaken them so that they're not a threat to Israel anymore. And so when he went and he fought the Amalekites, he saw, wow, they have a lot of sheep and they have a lot of animals and they have a lot of stuff. And you know what? I can offer those to God. He wasn't obedient to God. He was pragmatic and practical. He was balanced. But that's not how the Christian life works. Jesus made it very, very, very clear. You save your life, you're going to lose it. It's everything. If you don't love me more than your mother, father, your own life also, you can't be my disciple. Very clear, radical. A radical Christian is a normal Christian. So it's just normal. So let me just say that. Pastor Mello said it's a matter of love. Quoting Spurgeon, it's absolutely true. What did Jesus say? He that has been forgiven much loveth much. It's a matter of reality. Do you appreciate and love Jesus for dying for your sins? If you don't love him, then you don't think much of the sins that have been forgiven. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You see, I've said many times that love is very practical. It's not just an emotion. It's shown by what you do. God so loved the world that he gave. So if you don't have great love for Jesus, it's because you're not thinking about forgiveness of sins. You're not thinking about reality. It's, it's not real to you. And that's a shame. The Christian life 
is not only a challenge, but it's exciting. It is exciting. I don't say I always think it's exciting. I don't say that I'm always joyful. I don't say that. But I do know, do know one thing. When I'm in a good place with God, I feel like Samson in the way of nothing. Nothing can trip me. I'm thinking God is so real. And the love of God, eternity is so real. What are these temptations? No, I want more of God and more of Christ. And you know what I mean if you're a Christian. When you're in a good place and you commune with God, you feel that all the promises are so true. That Christ overcame the world. And because God gives you faith in Christ, you've overcome the world. You're not touched by temptation. I'm not saying I feel that way all the time. But I know this, when things are real and I love God more, then it's true. That's my word to Christians. If you are not moved at all, if you're not convicted at all, if you're not, if you're not encouraged at all, there's something really wrong because that's not your reality. That's not your, that's not your focus because you're, you should either be convicted or inspired if you're a Christian. Now, let me talk to the lost for a minute. The passage says that when you go through a trial, that you're blessed, that you're happy if you endure it. Now, reason with me for a minute. Everybody goes through hard times, right? Not just Christians. Everybody goes through hard times. We've all had people die that you know. You've all had afflictions whether it's sickness, whether it's pain, whether it's disappointment, whether a relationship, all of people have had hard times. That's what I said this morning, because mankind is cursed. And so we all have to endure the trials of life and God's judgment of sin in general. Just because something bad happens to somebody doesn't mean they're a sinner. That's what Jesus said. He said, do you think the Galileans, do you think they're sinners above them all? What about the Tower of Siloam that fell? The disciples thought, those are bad sinners. Tragedy happened to them. They must be bad. What did Jesus say? Except you repent. You shall all likewise perish, you see. So like Brother Melville said, if you're going through a trial and somebody is having a hard time, if they're a Christian, we shouldn't pass judgment on them because they may very well endure, whereas you might not. Or they may be a lost person. It doesn't mean that they're sinners more than everyone else. So we got to be careful. I said this morning, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. But let me tell this to the lost person. I said trials and disappointments and hardships happen to everyone. But the difference is this. There is a purpose to every trial that a Christian goes through. It's to test us. That's what temptation means, to test. And if we succeed and are victorious, if we endure, then we get a reward. Then we get closer to the throne of grace. We have more fellowship with God. There's a reason for every hardship that the Christian have. But if you're lost, you have nobody to help you to get it through. There is no reason by God that you're going through that. Nothing that you can point to. You're alone. You have nothing to look forward to. Your future is uncertain. Actually, it is certain. If you don't have Christ, you're under judgment. And you're, that's hanging over you. And you can suppress the truth of God, like I mentioned this morning. You can suppress it. But it's still there. It's still there in a nightmare. It's still there when you, you get depressed when you're by yourself because you're walking through life alone. And you're, it's all uncertain. And every single disappointment you can't, like the Christian, say, this is to test me because God will reward me. 
I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You have no such hope. The life's a mystery. You don't know what's going on. And that's because of sin. Yes, you need forgiveness of sins, but you're not thinking about that. So let me offer you what eternal life is. It means that you have life with God. That God knows you. That everything that happens to you is for the purpose of God. And there's great, there's great comfort in that. You can go to sleep and put your head down. You might have had a hard day. Things are ahead. But praise God. God's in control. God's on his throne. God, give me mercy to serve you, to love you, to be faithful to you, to endure temptations. There's hope. We have a God that invites us to talk to him, that he will help you. You have no such God. All the insecurities of your life, you got to deal with yourself. And you know what? You're going to lose. Come to Christ and experience God, experience peace with God, experience a future. You have a future with Christ, a good future, a future in heaven. And every step you take, if you lean upon God, he will guide you. He will lead you. There's great comfort in that. Why live separate from God, worried about your future? just hoping that you'll be happy because you'll land a job or a girlfriend. Is that all life is about for you, just a girlfriend? You'll find that that will not satisfy. These things are good. We should have relationships. We should have a family. We should have friends. These are good. But there's no replacement for God. You need God. You will never be satisfied. You will never have direction, never have hope. Never have life without God. You should be thinking about your sins for forgiveness of sins. That will drive you to Christ. But just think about your life right now. You are miserable. You're hopeless. Your life is a social media or thinking that you'll get, or the girl will say yes or something, or, you, you, or that you'll get a job or promotion. How small is your life? Is that all your life is worth? Five dollars more than an hour? Is that all you're living for? When God offers you eternal life through Jesus, and you're not interested in that, but you're interested in being heartbroken because the next girl will probably break your heart. That's the truth, and you know it. Yet you go back again in your vanity, whereas God is there all the time inviting you to the Lord Jesus. Come. Trust my son, have pleasures forevermore. And everything you go through has a reason and you have a God to call upon and a savior to be your friend and to guide you. He could be your shepherd and you will never have a need. And even though, even when you go through the valley of the shadow of death, you will not fear any evil because Jesus will never leave you. The life that Jesus offers you is a beautiful life. Yes, it's hard at times, but your life is hard too, and even worse. You need Christ. Come and trust him in a washer, sins away, and you'll have a life that's so, it's so great, and you'll want to live that life. You see, there's never been a true Christian that said, you know, I tried that, been there, done that. No, I'm trying something else. No, that doesn't happen. You should think about that. What other things in your life can you say that about? Some people go to a profession. No, it wasn't for me. That never happens to the true Christian. Because when you have life, you will never go back to death. Let's all stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the eternal life that we have through thy son. We thank thee that everything that we go through, hardships, Joy, everything we go through is designed by you, tailored by you. Help us, God, to trust you more. 
And so that everything that we're, we're, we go through, we see your design and we want to be faithful. Help us, God, to remember the great sins, the many sins that Jesus has in his death we are forgiven for. And so help us to love him more. Help us have real love that leads to obedience. And God, help us to be more victorious and to endure temptation when it comes, that we can be closer to the, to the throne of God, closer to thy son, get a better glimpse of him, God. Lord, I pray for the lost, that thou would help them to sense their insecurity without you. Help them to sense that they do have sin and they're not right with you. God, speak to their heart right now and show them that their life has no direction and they need hope. They need peace. They need forgiveness of sins. They need you through the Lord Jesus. Draw them to thy son. We thank you for today. Lord, be with all of our people. Strengthen us, God, and help us to come together by thy grace, be able to come together and to have less restrictions that the Omicron in the community would die down, that we would be able to enjoy one another's physical presence very soon. In the meantime, protect all of us, God, by thy grace and power. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. If you want to talk to either Pastor Mello and I and your loss, you can approach us anytime. It will be our privilege to talk to you. And you need to take care of that. Don't push it behind. Don't procrastinate. Don't gamble with your life. You need Jesus and you know it. Begin life now with Christ. Talk to us. Talk to Mr. Mello, myself. All right, your excuse. Thank you.